everyone. Welcome to Novel Ideas, episode number 80. I'm Candace Huber, your host and the owner of Chubby and Coo's Mid-City Bookshop in New Orleans. Novel Ideas is all about what I do best, books and board games. I bring you news, discussions, interviews and more every month. And most importantly, I make your TBR and or gaming list that much longer. This month, I'll briefly discuss some industry news, spend two segments on our book of the month, Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi, just because I have so much to say. I will introduce you to a new segment called Tables and Fables, where I pair books with board games and bring you an interview with Brian Camp, author of The City of Lost Fortunes, a fantasy book releasing April 17th. That lovely song you're hearing is Brave by Jonathan Colton off his newest album, Solid State. So grab a cup of your favorite beverage, pull up a chair, and let's chat. Let's start with some book industry news. So I found out on Tor.com, which is a blog that I read regularly. If you like sci-fi and fantasy, you should also read it regularly. According to Tor.com, Patrick Rothfuss, who is the author of The King Killer Chronicles, which includes The Name of the Wind and Wise Man's Fear, stated on an Emerald City Comic Con panel that he's, quote, an author who has tricked you into reading a trilogy that is a million word prologue, unquote. So, like, what does that mean? So this entire King Killer Chronicle trilogy is just like a giant prologue leading up to something else? So it would appear, I guess, that Kavoth's story is just part of some longer, presumably even more epic story that's like just starting to gain steam. So I guess we'll find out at some point if he ever finishes. There's still a third book in this giant prologue. So we shall see. Also, the Hugo Awards finalists have been announced. And so they... On the last podcast, I talked about the Nebula Award winners or the Nebula Award finalists. So since then, they have also released the finalists for the Hugo Awards. So I'll go over some of the main categories for that. But you can also find all of the finalists at www.thehugoawards.org. Make sure you put the the in there. So for best novel, the nominees are The Collapsing Empire by John Scalzi from Tor. New York 2140 by Ken Stanley Robinson from Orbit. Providence by Anne Leckie from Orbit. Raven Stratagem by Yoon Ha Lee from Solaris. Six Wakes by Mer Lafferty from Orbit. And The Stone Sky by N.K. Jemisin from Orbit. So Orbit seems to have dominated the category this year, but those are, I'm really excited that The Stone Sky has been nominated. I really want N.K. Jemisin to win just so that all of her whole trilogy has won. Um, But those are exciting nominees. Also, for Best Series, the nominees are The Books of Roxora by Martha Wells from Nightshade, The Divine Cities by Robert Jackson Bennett from Broadway, Encrypted by Shanna McGuire from DAW, The Memoirs of Lady Trent by Marie Brennan from Tor U.S., The Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson from Tor U.S., and World of the Five Gods by Lois McMaster Bujold from Harper Voyager. So those are best series. For best graphic story, we have Bitch Planet Volume 2, President Bitch, written by Kelly Sue DeConnick, illustrated by Valentine Delandro and Taki Soma from Image Comics. Black Bolt Volume 1, Hard Time, written by Saladin Ahmed, illustrated by Christian Ward from Marvel. Monstrous, Volume 2, The Blood, written by Marjorie Liu, illustrated by Sana Takeda from Image. My Favorite Thing is Monsters, written and illustrated by Emil Ferris from Fantagraphics. Paper Girls, Volume 3, written by Brian K. Vaughn, illustrated by Cliff Chang from Image Comics. And Saga, Volume 7, written by Brian K. Vaughn, illustrated by Fiona Staples from Image Comics. Best Dramatic Presentation Long Form, which are movies, So we have Blade Runner 2049, written by Hampton Fancher and Michael Green from Columbia Pictures. Get Out, written and directed by Jordan Peele from Blumhouse Productions. The Shape of Water, written by Guillermo del Toro and Vanessa Taylor from TSG Entertainment, Fox Searchlight. Star Wars The Last Jedi, written and directed by Ryan Johnson from Lucasfilm. Thor Ragnarok, written by Eric Pearson, Craig Kyle, and Christopher Yost from Marvel Studios. And Wonder Woman, screenplay by Alan Heinberg, story by Zack Snyder and Alan Heinberg and Jason Fuchs, 
from DC Films' Warner Brothers. There are a ton of other categories for the Hugo finalists, so definitely check that out at www.thehugoawards.com. Get details and links to the news that I discussed today in the show notes on our website, www.tubbyandcoos.com slash blog. It's time for our book of the month. Each month, I'll introduce you to one of my picks and announce the book for next month so you can read along if you choose. You can also discuss our books of the month and get updates in our discussion group on Goodreads. Just search for Tubby Ampersand Coos with an apostrophe S, or the link will be in the show notes as well. This month's pick is Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi, and I decided to dedicate two segments of this podcast to it because I have so much to say on it. This is why the news was a little bit shorter than it usually is, because I wanted to give more time to this book, because there's just a lot to say about it. So to start with Children of Blood and Bone, I would like to bring you on a journey of Candace and my fantasy opinions. So fantasy is a genre that I lost interest in like a while ago, frankly. Um, After Tolkien came onto the scene and introduced the epic hero's journey, there have been a lot of copycats, and I feel like every single fantasy book started feeling the same to me. Every fantasy story started feeling the same. So, you know, it's like a young teenage or, you know, college-age white kid who, a white man, so normally it's a young white man, he's a he's living a simple life that gets like interrupted from a quest that's thrust upon him by some like old wizard dude and then he has to undergo this like dangerous journey to save something which is normally like the girl, his hometown, the country, the world, or himself, which is like my favorite one. He enters, he encounters obstacles and he collects sidekicks and probably he falls in love with some like beautiful, irresistible elf. He completes his quest and then he returns home, a hero and a changed man. Like how many times have we seen that story? It's basically every fantasy story. And I'm not knocking the hero's journey. I think that trope can be used in really interesting and and different ways. But the idea of this, like, white man going on a journey to save the world, blah, 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 I've just, like, lost interest in it. So bring me, that brings me to The Children of Blood and Bone. This book is the story of Zaley Adebola, who is a teen who definitely does not have a mundane, simple life. She's seen her share of trauma, She has this quest thrust upon her by this older ex-Magi woman to undergo a dangerous journey to save magic and bring magic back to the world. With the help of her brother Zane and a rebellious princess, Amari, she encounters obstacles, has to outsmart the crown prince, Anon, who has his own past haunting him, and Zaley has to learn to believe in herself to complete her quest and save magic. Sound familiar to you? So here's the difference between those two. Tomi Aniemi takes that hero's journey, that epic hero's journey structure that we've seen a million times in like every fantasy book and draws on her Nigerian roots to populate this world of Orisha, which is the name of her world, with these huge panthenaires and lionaires and snow leponaires and dashikis and galeys and jollof rice and all these like rich colors and smells and unique architecture and she uses the language of yoruba so she completely just rejects this western european fantasy framework of the hero's journey to create this world that's full of black people number one and a story that has a focus on black women and Through that, she just thoroughly dismisses white maleness as the default mode of fantasy and gives us this story that really celebrates black culture and black women. She builds this like awesome, magnificent, immersive world that touches on all of your senses and she explores social themes, like a million different social themes. She channels the magic and world building of Black Panther and then the social justice themes of... Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give, which I've talked about on this podcast before, into this, like, breathtaking fantasy. So I loved it. I loved this book so much. 
I really loved that the story centers on two strong black women who approach their individual journeys in really starkly different ways and who come from completely different backgrounds. They come from different levels of privilege, but they're still able to learn from each other and grow together. So the main character, Zaley, is what's called a diviner in the books. So diviners are children of magi. And in the history of this world, mag all the magi were killed, including Zaley's mother, in a raid that was perpetrated by the king, King Sauron, who decided to just kill all the magi. The princess in this book, Amari, so this was her dad who has killed all the magi, killed Zaley's mom, destroyed Zaley's home. So Amari is this like privileged princess who comes with her own personal trauma, but she is able to reject her upbringing and use her place of privilege to help the diviners. Although the entire time, Zaley, who comes from a very different place as a diviner, as someone who has been affected by the horrors that Amari's father has really perpetrated on the world, she just relentlessly chastises Amari the whole time for being this privileged princess who doesn't understand how the real world works. Because Zaley, like I said, was born a diviner. She's always lived this life of oppression at the hand of Amari's father, the king. But as the story develops, Zaley and Amari really learn more about each other. They grow together. They start understanding more about each other's personal traumas. Zaley starts understanding more about Amari that even though she does come from a place of privilege, she has seen her own share of trauma. Amari starts understanding more about how her father's actions have oppressed not just Zaley, but all diviners everywhere. And both of these women show so much strength in different ways. And Adeyemi really isn't afraid to portray that intimacy of their friendship and show how women support and protect each other and uplift each other in these beautiful, beautiful ways. And I was just so impressed with that relationship between Zaley and Amari in this book. I also really loved Anand's journey and how Adeyemi used his character to shed light on the struggle of identity. So Anand is the crown prince who is sent to hunt down Zaley and Amari. And so in through his journey, Adeyemi really shows uh, the identity struggle of reconciling who you really are with how society views you and reconciling your past, including the past history of all of your ancestors and with your future. So Anand is really driven by a duty to his country. He's driven by self-loathing. He's driven by both a fear of and wanting to please his father and he consistently struggles with who he is and how he can best serve his country and then how those things conflict with what he really wants. So I really feel like his struggles and Amari's struggles directly parallel the identity struggles of people of color who must reconcile who they are with how society views them and also the struggles of allies in a lot of ways. And in many ways, this book can really be seen as just a general allegory for the struggles of marginalized groups because of course, black struggles are very prominent, but also glimpses of queer issues and the struggles of oppressed religions and gender oppression come through. The king's aversion to the magi and the way people talk about them is really akin to the way people talk about queer people, like down to the fact that diviners are called maggots in this book, which can clearly be seen as a reference to a similar sounding queer slur, if you get what I'm laying down. Also, the Magi observe their own religion in the book, and it's separate from the generally accepted religion, and the pockets of diviners who still practice that religion are forced to do so in these, like, secret enclaves hidden away from the rest of the world, like, up in the mountains and forests and stuff, so they aren't raided and killed while they're just trying to practice their religion. And also, of course, gender is, like, one of the most obvious themes in this book because... While women are magically and physically powerful in this world, men still dominate women's bodies and the power structure. They gaslight and manipulate at every turn. And one of the most disappointing things for me, I guess, about this book was that there was definitely a male-female dynamic going on. But agender and non-binary folks uh, and people of other genders weren't really represented. So that was one thing that I was a little bit disappointed in, but that's par for the course. I mean, non-binary and people who aren't male or female really aren't represented in many places. So that's 
you know, take that for what it's worth. But overall, it's really great. Children of Blood and Bone is a really great book. Obviously, I loved it. I mean, it's not perfect, so I will say that. Like I just said, non-binary folks and, and agender folks and people of other genders that aren't male or female aren't really represented in the book. Also, it has some of the pitfalls that I tend to see in some YA novels, like mainly some unnecessary romance going on and Zaley just incessantly berating herself, as teenagers do. Um, some points were sort of repetitive, like they it followed some characters who were physically together in the book, and so it provided sometimes unneeded viewpoints and like rehashed events that had just happened from a different person's point of view. So... There were some things that, you know, obviously it wasn't perfect because nothing is perfect. And in the end, it is a teen novel, and I am not that target audience. I am not a teenager. And so, of course, like certain aspects of that didn't really appeal to me. But I loved this book in general. I think it's really important. I'm really glad it was written. I'm really glad it was published. I'm really glad Tomi Adeyemi decided to share her story with us this magnificent world building like you should read it if for nothing else for the world building because it was very immersive the way Adiyemi weaves social issues and Nigerian culture into the storytelling is really deft the characters were relatable and real the plot was enthralling I was really enraptured from the start and never wanted to put the book down and even after I was done I wanted to pick it right back up and immediately read it again. It was really good. I very thoroughly enjoyed it. So if you love the world building and representation in Black Panther, particularly the Black Girl Magic of the Door Milaje, and if you love the magic system and the sprawling world of Harry Potter, if you're familiar with Avatar The Last Airbender and the magic systems that that employs and you like it, if you like any or all of those things, you will absolutely love this book. Because, of course, Black Panther and Harry Potter go together like peas and carrots. <laughs> so that is Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. I'm so happy she shared her story with us. With a debut novel like this, she's really bound to take the fantasy world by storm. And I cannot wait to see what she does next. Do you agree, disagree, have more to say? Tell me what you think in our Goodreads discussion thread. Just search for Tubby and Coos on Goodreads or follow the link in the show notes. Next month, I'll be discussing The Sea Beast Takes a Lover by Michael Andreessen. This is a book of fantastical short stories grounded in the real world. From Penguin's website, quote, Andreessen's stories are simultaneously daring and deeply familiar, unfolding in wildly inventive worlds that convey our common yearning for connection and understanding. With a captivating new voice from an incredible author, The Sea Beast Takes a Lover uses the supernatural and extraordinary to expose us at our most human, unquote. Michael will also be on the podcast next month, so I can't wait to talk with him about this book. It sounds so interesting, and it'll be really cool to do a book of the month and also have that author on the show. So if you decide to read it with me, please go to our Goodreads discussion group and on that thread, let me know your thoughts. I may feature your thoughts on the podcast next month. In this new segment, aptly titled Tables and Fables, I will introduce you to one book and one board game that are linked in some way. Books and board games go together like peas and carrots. For this first segment, I decided to pair Jeff Vandermeer's book, Annihilation, with North Star Games' board game, Evolution. Annihilation, from Jeff Vandermeer, is dubbed weird science fiction, and if you've read it or if you've seen the movie, you'll know why. Annihilation is the first book in the Southern Reach trilogy, and it follows an expedition team of four women, a biologist, an anthropologist, a psychologist, and a surveyor, who set out into an area known as Area X, where nature has reclaimed the last vestiges of human civilization. The first expedition returned with reports of this pristine landscape. The second ended in mass suicide. The third ended in a hail of gunfire as its members turned on one another, etc. This In Annihilation, we join the 12th expedition. So their mission is to map the terrain, record all observations of their surroundings and of one another, and above all, avoid being contaminated by Area X itself. They arrive expecting the unexpected, and Area X delivers. They discover a massive topographic anomaly and life forms that surpass understanding. The life forms in here have just evolved into really weird things. 
So similarly, the board game evolution is driven by environment, just like Annihilation. In this board game, two to six players grow and adapt their own species in a dynamic ecosystem where food is scarce and predators lurk. Evolution takes place around a watering hole that acts as the focal point of a small ecosystem full of early animals. So in the beginning of the game, all player animals are functionally similar. But then as time passes and the game goes on, players can add new traits to differentiate their animals from one another and to evolve their animals. And as the number and population of species grows in the game, the watering hole, which has a variable supply of food, might not have enough food to feed everything and everyone. So at that point, species can either gather more food at a time, they can gather food from other sources, or they can start feeding off the other species. When the environment requires it, the species have to adapt. If they can't or don't adapt, they die out. New species can then take their places and the circle of life continues. Whoever has the most food at the end of the game wins. Evolution is a really simple to learn board game, but what makes it so fun is that with over 4,000 ways to evolve your species, every game becomes a different adventure. The theme of evolution is really what drives the play, and you can create weird creatures in it that would like very easily populate Area X. So they were both released in the same year, which I think is really interesting. Annihilation and Evolution were both released in 2014. And they both focus on the environment and the weird things that can happen and evolve if the environment is left to its own devices. Both Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer and Evolution from North Star Games are survival of the fittest with a weird twist and with environmental evolution sort of themes. So if you like one, you're definitely sure to like the other. Both Annihilation and Evolution are available for purchase at Tubby and Coos. For this month's interview segment, I'd like to welcome Brian Camp. Brian is a graduate of the Clarion West Writers Workshop and the University of New Orleans Low Residency MFA program. He has been, at various points in his life, a security guard at a stock car racetrack, a printer in a flag factory, an office worker in an oil refinery, and a high school English teacher. He started his first novel, The City of Lost Fortunes, which is releasing April 17th in the backseat of his parents' car as they evacuated for Hurricane Katrina. And that's the book we're going to talk about today. He lives in New Orleans with his wife and their three cats, one of whom is named after a superhero. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me. So what superhero is your cat named after? I'm uh, sure everyone asks that. But. Actually, uh, yeah, I get that quite a bit <laughs> uh, now that I put that in my bio. Um, that is uh, Kal-El. Uh, he goes by Cal. Um, my, uh, he's a little tabby that, uh, you know, my wife got her cat first, uh, and she's very much her cat. Uh, and, you know, she got to name her, and so when we got another cat, I said, well, you can get another cat, but I have to be able to name it, and I'm going to name it something nerdy. Uh, and I picked pretty much the nerdiest thing, you yeah. know, Superman's Kryptonian name, <laughs> just to see if she was really committed to the to the nerd name, uh, and it stuck. So nice. Uh, that's so, him. Cal. And what's the Cal. other cat's name? Uh, Vaca. She Vaca we got her off the street in Mexico actually, oh, wow. uh, and she's black and white like a Holstein cow. So Vaca is nice. Spanish for cow. How did you get her back from Mexico? It's a it's a long it's a long story. Yeah, we, we don't have oh, well, we don't have time for no, that story. Okay, well you'll have to tell me that yeah. at some point. Well, how you got her back from Mexico? Because I didn't know that. Um, so what I do want to talk about because well our listeners do love cats, but <laughs> I do want to talk about your book before we get into other things. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the book and just briefly what it's about. Sure. Uh, so the title is The City of Lost Fortunes, and it is a murder mystery set in a post-Katrina New Orleans where the gods of different mythologies really exist. Uh, and the main character is a demigod, uh, but he doesn't know which god his father is. Uh, and so he shows up to a poker game with Toth from Egyptian myth, uh, Legba from voodoo, a vampire, an angel, and the fortune god of New Orleans. Uh, and the fortune god gets murdered, and he's got to figure out who did it. And if you're not interested at this point, then you should just stop <laughs> listening to my show because those are like all the things that I like to talk about. So um, you were recently in the bookstore, um, which Brian's in the bookstore fairly often. Some of you may have even seen him in there. And we were talking about the ethics of storytelling, which is just a topic that I've been mm. very fascinated with, as you know, recently. So I want to sort of recreate that conversation a little bit. And sure. I want you like... 
as far as the ethics of storytelling, just for the people who don't know, so we were just kind of talking about things to consider when you're writing and how not to harm groups of people in your writing. So what are some of the things that you had to consider along those lines when writing The City of Lost Fortunes? Um, well, one of the things is, uh, you know, when you're talking about myth, uh, it can be really easy uh, to get in your head and, and just think about these things as stories, you know, just think about these things as you know, uh, you, a lot of people study the, the Greek and Roman myths in school, uh, and then there's a a real immediate gray area that happens where for some people these these things that we consider myth um, aren't really myth. They're, they're living faith structures. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then you move into things like folklore. Uh, and so if you look at the, the people who are sitting around the table, the beings, I guess, that are sitting around the table... Uh, you know, you've got Toth. I mean, I, I could be mistaken here, but I don't think there are too many people that, are, you know, still consider Toth uh, a being that they would uh, necessarily uh, worship. You know, they, they might think of in the abstract as kind of a figure that they uh, that's important to them, you know, mm-hmm. but not necessarily a being that they they believe lives and works in this in this world. Mm-hmm. Um but then you have things like vampires, which are obviously a, a figure of folklore, which at one point, yeah, people really were afraid of these things. Um, but and then, you've, and then you've got stuff like Legba, where it, it really is. There are people who, who believe that Legba lives and moves in their world and is, is someone that um, and, and I got a lot of this, uh, a, lot of, a lot of that thinking from uh, Nisi Shaw. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she she told me about you know her relationship with Trickster and Legba and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so, talking one of the things that we talked about was uh, you know changes that I that I had made in my thinking in mm-hmm. terms of you know what I could use and what I shouldn't use or or things like that. Uh, and so, in earlier drafts of the novel, um, I had Coyote there, uh, and Coyote is from um, is a is a Trickster figure from a. a a, a number of different um, native cultures. Um, but whereas, you know, living in New Orleans and having a little bit of a background with voodoo and knowing, you know, what's in the popular culture and what's the real faith and kind of, you know, having a at least a, an idea of what I could talk about and what I shouldn't talk about and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have that kind of relationship. One of the one of the uh, the phrases that that I like to use is, uh, or that I've that I've heard that, you know, uh, you 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 probably shouldn't write about people if you haven't been in their living room. You know. Yes, um, I like that. And um, you know, I don't necess- I don't really have that. I don't I don't have those kind of relationships in my life with with people of that culture. Uh, and so I, you know, I took a step back from that and said, you know, not that, not that Coyote couldn't exist in my world, but just that necessarily I shouldn't be giving him voice and giving him actions because I don't know what would be offensive to someone from that culture and what would be fine, you know? Yeah. And I think that's really interesting because it's, you know, as we were talking about, I am interested in what writers have to think about and what they don't. And especially, I feel like with speculative fiction, sci-fi and fantasy, when you are using these, you know, myths, because a lot of fantasy books use myths. So to to actually have to think about, oh, well, are these just stories or are people still practicing, mm-hmm. I think is something very real that that a lot of writers have like come across right. and you know the the other thing that we had sort of talked about was writing other types of people you have women in your book you right. have like one of your characters is black you are not black or a woman so right. Right. <laughs> um you know so outside of myths when you're just writing people who aren't like you what was your process for that or did you have one um I, I didn't necessarily treat them any differently than I would have treated um, a character who was very much like me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, you know, doctors have the Hippocratic Oath, and I really kind of think that writers ought to have something like that, you mm-hmm. know. And so that's that's something that's kind of in the back of my head when I'm when I'm writing a character, you know, is to, is to do no harm. Mm-hmm. Um even villains, uh, you know, and, and especially villains in a lot of ways, because who we who we choose 
um, to to vilify says a lot about us as people. Uh, and so my vampire, for instance, um, is is a a villainous kind of creature uh, in folklore. They are monsters, you know. <laughs> right. Um, and um, he's he's also fat and. I had to I had to take a lot of care um, in in talking about that character to not make his fatness monstrous. He is a monster, and I, I thought of him as as fat because he because vampires in the folklore are figures of of hunger and and lusts, uh, and in in kind of my envisioning of him, he's a lot like a tick. You know, yeah. he, he lives off of blood, and he he's a his, he's constantly is feeding. Uh, and so he's he's overweight because he's he's not really into exercise, you know. I mean, yeah. and I'm a big guy myself, um, but you know, it's it it can be very easy to fall into those those literary shorthands, you know, of ugly equals villainous or fat equals villainous or dark equals bad. Mm-hmm. And when when you fall into those places, you you know, you really are. Well, first off, it's lazy writing, um, but it's also harmful to people who are. Uh, who live life as a fat person or as a dark person or as a uh, a person with a disability or, or any of those kinds of shorthands to show uh, villainy. Uh, and so in terms of showing real people, and so that's, you know, that's kind of the easy one of the vampire, uh, but show, in terms of uh, real people, you know, uh, someone of a particular ethnicity or someone with a disability or whatever, um, you know, again, you you have to kind of keep those things in mind, you know, like what is someone who is going to recognize themselves in this character? Are they going to feel like I handled it in a way that did no harm, you know? Right. And so this is like a weird segue, but (laughs) I just, we don't have a lot of time left, but I want to know um, as far as publishing, this is your debut novel. It's right. your your first book. So, how did publishing this publishing deal like change things for you, or did it? Um, I assume it changed. Well, things. Uh, so the the joke that I told people was that I had eleven years to write the first book, yeah, uh, and eleven months to write the second one. <laughs> uh, so I was when I first sold the novel. Uh, I was a high school English teacher, uh, and then when I looked at you know, writing a novel from scratch in less than a year uh, and teaching almost 100 students uh, who all wrote essays. I mean, it was junior and senior in high school yeah. uh, who all wrote essays and had quizzes to grade and all that. Uh, those those two things did not match up very well. Uh, and so I am no longer a high school English teacher. So that's the, you know, that was always kind of the dream, you know, teach English yeah. until sell a book and then sell a book and then not be an English teacher. Uh, but the, that was, you know, that was what I thought in high school, but you know, the, that's not, not necessarily a career trajectory that made sense once I actually got into it. Right. Uh, but it is, it happened to be the way it shook out. So it worked well, out pretty well. That's awesome. When it shakes out that way, huh. I think. Um, so where can people find you if they want to look for you online or in person or any of that stuff? Where, uh, where so you I'm on Twitter at Brian Camp, uh, B-R-Y-A-N-C-A-M-P. Um, uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. Um the easiest thing to do would be to go to briancamp.com uh, and and follow all those links. Uh, in terms of in person, uh, Thursday the seventeenth, I will be at Garden District Books, uh, launching and reading and signing. Uh, and then May nineteenth, May nineteenth, yeah. I will be at Tubby and Coos doing yes. the same thing. So uh, so go out and get this book. I think that oh, so Brian will be at Tubby and Coos May nineteenth, two to four p.m. Uh, signing this book. Uh, We will obviously have copies of the book when it comes out on April 17th. And as Brian said, you can see him at Garden District Bookshop on the 17th as well for his launch. I think that if you like, in my opinion, if you like American Gods and or you like the TV show Supernatural, I think you will like Brian's book. It's it's because of 
the gods in it. Like you said, it's like gods sitting around a poker table and it's amazing. And then also it's very, it felt to me like I was watching Supernatural, which is a compliment coming from me because I love that show. It may not be a compliment coming from everyone, but I thought it was awesome. I really liked Brian's book. I, I think everyone should buy it because American Gods and Supernatural go together like peas and carrots. That's been my that's been my <laughs> stupid joke this whole time. That's all the time we have for this month. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for I having appreciate me. you for I appreciate you coming. Join me again next month for more book industry news. My book of the month discussion of The Sea Beast Takes a Lover by Michael Andreasen, along with an interview with Michael himself, and a brand new segment called Write Write, where I discuss writing tips and tricks. You can find a recap of this month's podcast, including links at www.tubbyandcoos.com slash blog. You can also find the bookstore on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Tubby and Coos and spelled out. And finally, a list of all the books our book clubs are reading, this podcast book of the month, and more can be found in our Goodreads discussion group. Just search for Tubby ampersand Coos with an apostrophe S or follow the link in the show notes. Tell us what you're reading and we'd love to discuss with you. The music you heard today is by Jonathan Colton off his newest album, Solid State. Thank you for listening to Novel Ideas on WRBH. I'm your host, Candace Huber. Keep on reading. Good things never last long when you've come to